Welcome everyone. Welcome to the first virtual series of 2022. I am Tracy Smith and I'm the new collaboration, education and outreach coordinator for the Center for Integrated Cellular Analysis here in New York City. In this seminar series, we highlight new papers and methods from our center that we believe to be of interest for the broader biology community. Today's seminar explores the epigenetic encoding of malignant cell states in diffuse gliomas. This work encompasses multiomic single cell profiling, integrating DNA methylation, transcriptome, and genotype within the same cells, and develops a quantitative framework to measure cell state heritability and transition dynamics underlying cancer development and evolution. As always, you'll be able to ask questions at the end of the talk. You can either raise your hand or use the little emoji in Zoom, and I'll ask you to unmute yourself, at, or you can type your question into the chat and I will read it to the speaker. <clears throat> Today's seminar will be presented by Federico Gaiti and Joshua Schiffman. Dr. Gaiti is an assistant professor at the University of Toronto and scientist at the Princess Margaret Cancer Center. He obtained his PhD in evolutionary biology and genomics from the University of Queensland, where he focused on understanding the evolutionary origin of two major players in human gene regulation, long non-coding RNAs and chromatin marks. As a postdoctoral fellow in Dr. Dan Lando's laboratory at Wild Cornell Medicine and the New York Genome Center, he studied the epigenetic determinants of cancer evolution in leukemia and glioma using novel single cell multiomics approaches. These studies were published as three first co-author publications in Nature, Nature Communications and Nature Genetics. His work has been recognized by prestigious fellowships and awards, including the NIH NCI Pathway to Independence Award, the American Society of Hematology Scholar Award, the Lymphoma Research Foundation Postdoctoral Fellowship, and the Le Leukemia and Lymphoma Society Award. And Dr. Josh Schiffman is a postdoctoral fellow in Dr. Dan Lando's lab at the New York Genome Center. He received his PhD in molecular and computational biology at the University of Southern California, where he studied gene regulatory network evolution and speciation. In the Landau lab, he uses mathematical modeling to study cancer evolutionary dynamics and has focused on the development of statistical inference methods for single cell multiomic datasets. So with that introduction, I will hand the reins over to Dr. Gaiti. Thank you. Thank you, Tracy, for the introduction. And hi, everyone. I'm Federico, and I'm very happy to discuss here today, together with Josh, our uh, uh, recent work in um, uh, using single cell uh, uh, multiomics to try and define the epigenetic encoding and plasticity of transcriptional cancer cellular uh, state, uh, specifically in glioma brain uh, tumor. And we know that in cancer, genetic diversity drive evolutionary selection, providing the, the cancer actually an opportunity to try out many different recipes to evolve and then adapt uh, to the therapy. But the outstanding adaptive capacity of cancer cannot be fully explained by genetic variation alone. We know that cellular phenotype is indeed encoded in multiple layers of information calling for an evolutionary model that comprises both genetic and non-genetic variation. And so the study of cancer requires the integration of multiple dimensions of intratumor variation. And so the main goal of our research is to integrate genetic, epigenetic, and transcriptional inf information in the study of cancer evolution, specifically at the single cell level, which is the fundamental evolutionary unit. So to pursue this uh, integration, we had developed a single cell multiomic platform in collaboration with the Broad Institute that allows to integrate DNA methylation uh, and whole transcriptome information with targeted sequencing of non-somatic uh, mutation all within the same cell and within the same sample, and then initially applied it to chart leukemia evolution. In this work, we have, we, we have shown that it, mutation, this 
stochastic heritable DNA methylation changes may serve as a molecular clock, uh, reflecting the number of generations in the cellular evolutionary history. And so as cancer cells divide, they accrue more and more errors in copying their epigenome, similar to the process of genetic diversification through genetic mutation accumulation. And, and now inspired by the seminal early works of Daryl Shibat and Simon Tavare on the methylation molecular clock, this notion motivated us to then use the stochastic heritable DNA methylation changes as native barcode to actually chart directly in this human patient sample the lineage histories of the cancer cell, similar to the transformative work that now allows lineage barcoding in, in model organisms. The uh, multi-omic uh, platform then allowed us to also project onto these cancer lineage trees additional sources of uh, information, such as genotyping information for specific mutation, and as well as uh, transcriptional information through interrogating the match uh, single cell RNA-seq uh, uh, data set. But, uh, at that point, we then wanted to leverage this multiomic uh, platform to inf inform the question of transcriptional cell state diversity in cancer. Uh, the notion that uh, cancer are actually composed of cells that are diverse in their transcriptional state has been reported for many years. If we think, for example, about axes of cell-to-cell -cell variation, such as epithelial to mesenchymal uh, transition. And then the expanding application of single cell RNA sequencing to primary human sample has shown that transcriptional cell state diversity is indeed found ubiquitously across many cancer types, but often in a way that is also partly independent of genetic clonal diversity. And so this observation prompt key fundamental question in human biology, how are these transcriptional cancer cell state encoded epigenetically, are they heritable? And can we learn something about the transition dynamic of the cellular state? Human uh, glioma serve as an instructive model to start addressing this question as uh, single cell sequencing technology have been deployed to measure genomic and transcriptomic heterogeneity, providing high resolution mapping of cell state diversity and revealing that single glioma uh, cell can be distributing al along axes of uh, diversity on the basis of cellular properties such as stemness, metabolism, or cellular uh, uh, specialization. And, and so we team up with Mario Suva Lab at MGH and Harvard Medical School and apply our multi-omic single cell method to 14 primary glioma patient sample, both IDH mutant uh, gliomas and IDH wild glioblastoma or GBM. We first separated the uh, malignant from non-malignant cell based on both gene expression and DNA methylation clustering, uh, allowing us now to work purely with the malignant cellular po uh, population, which will be far more limited using bulk sequencing approaches. And, uh, and then develop a method to now infer copy number aberration in this malignant cell based on the single cell DNA methylation data. This uh, approach enabled the robust uh, detection of amplification and deletion in malignant cell, such as, for example, the hallmark chromosome 7 gain and chromosome 10 uh, loss in GBM, and the chromosome 1P19Q co-deletion in IDH mutant glioma. Importantly, the uh, resolution afforded by this method was also far greater than single cell RNA-seq infer copy number aberration, resulting now in the ability to also capture focal changes as shown here, for example, for the oncogene EGFR, which will not be possible by simply using single cell RNA sequencing based inferences. And then this uh, approach also allow us to better understand genetic het heterogeneity. For example, in our court, we identify four genetic subclones marked by either the complete or partial chromosome six loss in different spatial region of the same tumor. They were also associated with different level of DNA 
activation compared to uh, non-malignant cell. And we are now trying to better understand this uh, relationship. Now, though our uh, multi-omic uh, uh, data provide this unique opportunity to directly examine the epigenetic uh, encoding of this uh, um, heterogeneous transcriptional cellular uh, state. And so we first wanted to show that our data set can actually uh, recapitulate the diversity of cell state previously uh, uh, reported with the presence of four core malignant cellular uh, state spanning stem or progenic or, uh, progenitor stem uh, state uh, uh, resembling neural progenitor cell or oligodendrocyte progenitor cell as well as more differentiated state associated with more like astrocyte like or mesenchymal like uh, program. Then the direct comparison of the DNA methylation profile across cellular state revealed that polycom repressive complex 2, PRC2 target were hypomethylated in this stem like state. And this hypomethylated PRC2 target were enriched for Hox and homeobox gene, as well as transcription and growth factor that were previously uh, reported to play a role in the epigenetic regulation of stemness in GBM. Now, we, we also know that PRC2 catalyzes H3K27 trimethylation, uh, leading to the repression of lineage-specific developmental gene in both normal and neoplastic uh, stem cell. H3K27 uh, trimethyl is largely enriched promoter of lineage specific developmental gene, along with A3K4 uh, ME3, forming what we know as a bivalent chromatin domain. And so, to then explore the link between DNA methylation, PRC2, and histone mark, we interrogated the differentially methylated promoter for enrichment of histone mark with non overlapping regulatory function. And so while hypomethylated promoter in more differentiated state were predominantly marked by histone modification uh, associated with active transcription, uh, hypomethylated promoter in stem-like uh, uh, state were instead enriching bivalent chromatin, suggesting that PRC2 complex activity may result in this poise transcription at this gene uh, promoter rather than in a, a, a complete uh, silencing. And this would preserve more their stemness uh, uh, potential. And to validate further this association between the stem-like state and PRC2 activity, we also reanalyze publicly available GBM single cell attack sequencing data. And we show here the genomic region that are typically bound by PRC2 are also more open and accessible in this stem-like state. And to, to, to further uh, examine this association in a larger sample court, we also uh, uh, leverage 67 GBM samples from the TCGA collection with a match bulk RNA-seq and DNA methylation profile. And consistent with our single cell finding, um, sample having higher stem like um, cell proportion based on the bulk RNA seq profile also showed this greater hypomethylation of PRC2 target. And so, uh, collectively, this data showed the DNA methylation of PRC2 target is a critical feature of GBM cell differentiation. And this epigenetic encoding of uh, GBM support the parallel between GBM differentiation and physiological neural uh, uh, development, where uh, stemness is actually also marked by PRC2 target hypomethylation. Uh, and so the, the model we are thinking here is that in this stem like um, cell, PRC2 is engaged, protecting this site from uh, undergoing DNA methylation. Its targets are therefore hypomethylated. And this allows a, a, a residual expression and ultimately preserving the stemness uh, potential in this stem like state. And uh, we also know that uh, our uh, findings are also uh, are still actually 
consistent with the canonical suppressive role of uh, PRC2 as its uh, target show lower gene expression than non-PRC2 uh, target as I'm showing in your, on your right. And um, however, the degree of uh, uh, repression was stronger in tumors that were uh, enriched for more differentiated state, which may further uh, uh, reinforce their gene silencing through involving DNA uh, methylation. And with our single cell multi-omic uh, data set, we can also ask how are the epigenetic and transcriptional uh, pattern altered with the presence of IDH uh, mutation. And a mutated IDH uh, produces two hydroxyglutaride, which is an onco uh, metabolite and a competitive inhibitor of the TET enzyme. TET enzyme also, we know, oxidize 5 methylcytosine to then promote demethylation. And so a deficiency in that enzyme activity should lead to increased DNA methylation. The direct comparison now of DNA methylation between GBM and IDH mutant indeed revealed that enhancers were particularly susceptible to hypermethylation in IDH mutant a cell consistent again with defect in that enzyme um, mediated uh, demethylation caused by the presence of IDH uh, mutation with also an answer DNA methylation increasing more with cellular differentiation from a stem like to a more differentiated cellular state. And while in cell population, high level of gene expression are often associated with low promoter DNA methylation, the epigenetic deregulation of gene expression through aberrant DNA methylation may also play a role in the malignant transformation of IDH mutant uh, cell. And we indeed uh, observe a decoupling of the typical anti-correlation between gene expression and promoter DNA methylation in this IDH mutant cell, leading to a positive correlation between DNA methylation and, and expression, such that the expression of genes that are central to the IDH mutant oncogenic phenotype, such as cell cycle or DNA damage uh, uh, response, persist despite this high uh, promoter DNA methylation uh, level. And uh, finally, we show single cell CTCF binding site hypermethylation in IDH uh, mutant, leading to the loss of gene insulation between topologically associating domain. And so for this analysis, we identify pairs of neighboring genes separated by CTCF binding site and then computed their gene expression correlation as a function of CTCF DNA methylation. And CTC, uh, uh, single cell CTCF binding site hypermethylation in IDH mutant cell correlated actually with the loss of gene ins insulation, which, which means the higher the DNA methylation level, the stronger the correlation in the expression of gene pairs across uh, boundaries. And again, this is consistent with IDH mutant um, um, a mutation uh, allowing this aberrant uh, regulatory interaction as was also previously uh, reported by um, Burstein group using bulk sequencing data. And so now going to our second major question, what is the heritability of this uh, transcriptional cellular uh, state? And this question we know is of clinical uh, significance because heritable expression uh, program may be related to non-genetic mechanism of therapy uh, resistance uh, in cancer. And now we'll pass it to Josh to tell you more uh, about it. So thank you uh, so much, uh, Tracy, for the nice introduction. And thanks, Fede, for a great introduction to the project and a nice explanation of epigenetic encoding of glioma cell states. Um, just to, I guess, reiterate, my name is Josh Schiffman, and I'm a postdoc in Dan Landau's lab at the New York Genome Center. Um, I'm going to continue our discussion on glioma evolution by explaining how we leverage the joint information of transcription and methylation at the single cell level to study uh, 
to reconstruct glioma lineages, to retrace their evolution, and to understand transcriptional heritability, and to try to infer cell state transition dynamics that may have clinical implications. So to begin, we first use the pairwise differences in epimutations to construct lineage trees. And epimutations, as Fede nicely explained, are stochastic inheritable DNA methylation changes. And the pairwise differences at the single cell level can be used to build lineage trees, very similar to how phylogenetic trees are built in evolutionary biology. And here you can see two examples of these of such a lineage trees that we reconstructed. On the left is one from an IDH wild type glioblastoma or GBM. And on the right is one from an IDH mutant glioma. Um, despite you know, reconstructing this with heritable methylation changes, we wanted to validate that the lineage structure was accurate. So we projected subclonal copy number aberrations, with the red and orange colors onto these trees. And you can see as would be expected from an accurate uh, reconstruction, the copy number aberrations form nice clusters on these trees, giving us confidence that these are actually structured like the true underlying lineages. After validating in these reconstructed lineage trees, we next projected cell states onto the glioma lineage trees, which are represent represented by the colored bars on the bottom below the copy number aberration uh, bars. And uh, cell states here are transcriptionally defined uh, based on the types of genes that they are highly expressing uh, within uh, highly expressing. So for example, a stem-like, uh, a, a cell considered stem-like would be expressing a lot of the genes associated with a stem-like phenotype. Um, as you can see from the projection of these different states, or maybe you uh, would, as I hope you can see, is that the distribution on the left GBM tree, the colored cell states appear to be quite random. The distribution doesn't seem like it depends very much on the structure of the lineage. However, if you look at the example tree on the right of an IDH mutant glioma, it appears to be a little bit more organized where we see an enrichment of oligodendrocyte or OC-like cells on the left that's represented by the greenish color. And on the right, there seems to be an enrichment of yellow astrocyte-like or AC-like cells. Um, despite this apparent enrichment, we wanted to make this observation a little bit more rigorous and quantify these patterns across different uh, samples that we have and see if there's a general pattern. Perhaps IDH mutant lineages are more organized than glioma, glioblastoma lineages as these two example trees appear. Um, but before we can determine this, we need a more, a more rigorous statistical framework. So to do that, we borrowed and applied Moran's eye, which is a classic measure of spatial dependence or more technically autocorrelation. And to give you an intuitive understand, uh, an intuitive understanding of what our, uh, autocorrelation measures. Uh, I have here an example of maybe the traditional spatial uh, case and then what our context looking at lineage trees. So in the top, you can see a two-dimensional grid, which might represent a landscape or maybe cells in a, in a dish or something like that. And you have two different colors. You have darker and lighter colors, which could represent two different cell states. On the grid of uh, where the dark colors are, you could think of uh, one of the cell states occupying that location and the lighter colors, uh, the other cell state occupying that location. Likewise, with the phylogenetic trees, the lineage trees below, dark cells are occupying the dark tipped locations where the other type of cell are in the light or white colored uh, tips. So what you can see on for both uh, the spatial and lineage examples on the left, it appears highly disorganized. There doesn't seem to be much organization to the distribution. Um, and we would say this has a low autocorrelation. In contrast to that, on the right, we can see that dark cells appear to segregate completely on the left side, and the same goes for the lineage below. We would say that this represents the highly autocorrelated uh, or highly organized lineage tree or spatial landscape. Um, the, the tree structure that we see on the right, since the cells are, not, are distributed in a very non-random way by descent, would indicate a high degree of cell state heritability, the key uh, evolutionary property that we are interested in here. So we then applied this methodology to our uh, patient glioma samples. And just to go into a little bit of detail of what we're looking at, if you look at the bar plot in the middle or on the left side, uh, purple represents our IDH mutant samples and uh, the pinkish colors are IDH wild type or glioblastoma. And you can see that five of the IDH mutant samples show a very significant Moran's eye score or, or uh, a very significant signature of cell state clustering on these trees indicating heritability of cell state and perhaps stability of differentiation hierarchies. In contrast to this, if you look at the pink bars, only two of the patient samples actually cross the threshold of significance, suggesting that most of these 
uh, trees appear to be quite random in their, the way they reflect the distribution of transcriptionally defined cell states. And this may be a consequence of plastic or less stable differentiation hierarchies. And then to actually go into even more uh, detail, instead of just looking at the autocorrelation and the heritability of cell states, we generalize the metric to look at cross-correlation, which is very similar, but it measures the pairwise clustering or organization of different cell states on trees. So an example, we can generate a heat map on the right there, which not only shows whether or not certain cell states are have an organized pattern when distributed across lineages, but how they might be distributed with other cell states. So for instance, darker, darker red colors or a higher value would suggest that cells of that state co-cluster near each other on the tree. And this is interesting to us because it might be indicative of underlying differentiation hierarchy structures or fate trajectories. Um, we can't directly infer that from the, these cross correlations, but we think it's a nice hint and might be reflective of underlying unobserved dynamics. So the next uh, the next attribute we tested with this uh, with this statistical methodology was to look not only at transcriptionally defined cell states, but to look at the expression of or in transcription of genes. So we first looked at two thousand variable genes and their correlations with each other and cross correlations, which I'll explain a little bit more in detail. So each point, each gray point in these two plots, represents a pairwise measurement between two genes. And on the y-axis, you're looking at correlation, which is your standard Pearson correlation. And on the x-axis, this measure of clustering or heritability is a measure of pairwise cross-correlation. So uh, the gray points represent all pairwise interactions of genes. The red points represent genes that are high, uh, for on the left for involved in the cell cycle, and on the right, genes involved in the stem-like phenotype. Now, what you'll notice is that maybe as expected, the pairwise relationships between cell cycle genes are highly correlated on average. You see a very strong signature of correlation. That makes sense because they form a functional module. You'd ex expect the expression of one would entail the expression of the other on average. However, you don't see much signature of uh, heritability or cross-correlation suggesting that there's no, uh, there's no obvious distribution of cycling cells on our lineage trees. However, in contrast, if you look at the right plot, these red dots seem to show that stem-like genes are highly correlated with one another, uh, which if you uh, think that they're part of the same sort of functional module makes sense. But we also see based on the slope there that they are highly cross-correlated so that this is probably a heritable, stable in time uh, uh, cell state or phenotype. So here we're just contrasting gene uh, modularity. It's you know genes functioning together versus how they're distributed on lineage trees. So next, these findings of how different genes express uh, the transcription of different genes and transcriptional cell states are distributed prompted us to ask what the rates or the underlying dynamic cell transition and evolutionary dynamics were that led to these observed patterns. This question is clinically important as we seek to therapeutically target defined cancer cell states such as cancer stem cells, and we need to know the relative rates at which other cells will revert to assume the role of stem cells after therapeutic targeting so that we can deprive tumors of their ability to regenerate. So to, to understand what the uh, unobserved differentiation and growth dynamics under these tumors might have been, we borrowed a mathematical framework often used in evolutionary biology, which normally looks at speciation rates and might usually people apply it to understand how different traits, uh, usually a binary characteristic will vary across an evolutionary tree, such as maybe the presence or absence of some interesting thing, maybe scales or something, depending on your question. Um, this model is called the uh, BISI, often referred to as the BISI binary state speciation and extinction model. And we use this to, instead of looking at speciation rates, can this is mathematically analogous to just looking at different style, uh, uh, cell type specific growth rates or transition rates. Now the transitions in our context would be differentiation from a stem-like state to a more differentiated mature-like state or de-differentiation, which is the transition of these mature cells back into a stem-like uh, state. So before we even fit this model to our patient samples, we wanted to simulate uh, the evolution of a model of tumor growth in, under this framework just to test our hypothesis that high organization and a tight distribution of cells into clusters on lineage trees was reflective of the underlying dynamics. Specifically, high heritability uh, would be uh, due to um, a, a non-plastic, a highly stable differentiation hierarchy. So what you can see here on the right is that we simulated a thousand different uh, tumor evolution trajectories and vary the de-differentiation rate back from mature cells to the stem-like cell compared to stem-like cell renewal. 
And what you can clearly see on the y-axis, which you know is the, the, what it represents is depicted in the cartoons in, in the middle of the evolutionary trees with the cell state distribution, is that as the dedifferentiation rate increases so that the, the differential differentiation hierarchy becomes less stable and more plastic, the lower the organization of the tree becomes and the lower the autocorrelation of Moran's I-score also becomes. So this suggests that there's a clear relationship between the distribution of transcriptionally defined cell states on lineage trees and their underlying differentiation hierarchy and dynamics. So to apply this to our data set, we, uh, Got, we used maximum likelihood estimation and estimated the different growth and transition rates for each patient sample. But as these are mathematical estimates, we wanted to make sure that we were actually you know, getting near the truth. So we wanted to validate these estimates with orthogonal experimental measurements. And we did this in two different ways. First, we compared the estimates of the mathematical model for growth to that of uh, an estimate based on the measurement of cycling cells. And the way we did this is cells that highly expressed cell cycle related genes were considered cycling. And we took the ratio of the growth rate of stem and mature cells and compared that to the ratio of the growth rates estimated by the mathematical model and observed a very high co correlation, which you can see on the scatter plot in the middle or on the left. Next, we looked at used RNA velocity to get an orthogonal estimate of transition rates. And the way we did this is we looked at stem and mature cells, and then looked at which, uh, if they either of these cells were exp highly expressing genes involved in the opposite cell state. So if a stem-like cell was highly expressing or was transitioning to express uh, genes in the mature cell st state as estimated by RNA velocity, we estimated that it was undergoing a transition. We then compared these this estimate of dedifferentiation specifically to the math mathematical model's estimate of dedifferentiation, and again, saw a very high correlation. We think that this strongly corroborates the estimates from the mathematical model. Uh, taking this all together, if you we looked at the, the dedifferentiation rates estimated for glioblastoma compared to IDH mutant, uh, what we noticed was that on average, dedifferentiation was much, much higher in glioblastoma compared to IDH mutant gliomas. Uh, this suggests, as I was alluding to before, that the low heritability that we observed in glioblastoma distribution of transcriptional cell states is linked to a much higher dedifferentiation rate and much more plastic differentiation hierarchy. This is in contrast to IDH mutant, which seems to have a much more stable differentiation hierarchy and exhibits a lot more transcriptional heritability in comparison. In summary, we think that in general, IDH mutant gliomas will resemble the lineage trees that are depicted on the cartoon on the left, which is very highly organized. Uh, this would be a product, as I mentioned previously, as a unidir unidirectional differentiation hierarchy. We can contrast this with IDH wild type glioblastoma, which might represent the more disorganized tree on the right. This likely reflects a bi plastic bidirectional differentiation hierarchy. Now in the lab, we are gearing up to validate this data-driven model through experimental lineage tracing assays. Overall, the data presented here uh, that single cell shows that single cell multiomics of human samples allows us to link transcriptional cell state diversity with fundamental evolutionary properties, such as heritability and cell state transitions. Importantly, these data allow us to engage clinically relevant questions, such as, for example, does the high degree of dedifferentiation observed in GBM glioblastoma present an additional mechanism by which tumors can replenish their stem-like cells under therapeutic pressure? Should we then target cell states other than the canonical stem-like cells? Or is it better to target cell state transitions to induce phenotype switching towards a more drug-sensitive state that limits relapse potential or maybe improves the amount, increases the amount of dormancy? This answer is a longstanding and fundamental question in the field that, the, that has implications for the paradigm of targeting cancer stem cells and challenges us to think about how to target plastic cell state transitions. With this, I'd like to thank, uh, I'd like to conclude and thank you for inviting us here uh, to present our work. Uh, thank you to everyone that contributed to this project, particularly our mentor, Dan Landau, and collaborator, Mario, Mario Suva. I'd also like to thank our co-authors and the rest of the Landau and Suva Labs. Thank you. Right. Thank you um, both so much for sharing your work with us. Uh, it was uh, yeah, really great talk. Uh, so we're going to move on to our uh, question and answer section. So if anyone has a question, please raise your hand or you can type your ch question into the chat box. Um, but maybe we'll just start out uh, with I, I had a question about um, 
So a lot of what you presented today is uh, was based on DNA methylation. Um, and so in the paper, I think it was noted that um, that the your data set for the methylome is incomplete. Um, how would you, uh, are there any caveats with how we should uh, take um, your messages here? Or how do you see, uh, do you see any advances on the horizon for new technologies or data analysis to um, deal with uh, incomplete methylome data sets. Yeah, maybe uh, I can take that, Josh, if, if you're fine with it. Thank you, Tracy. Yeah, so I mean, we, we know that, you know, the work has for sure several uh, limitations, like any work and specifically, you know, the, the main one is about the fact that this specific um, single cell methylation uh, method, which is based on a, a reduced representation by sulfate uh, sequencing basically only capture approximately like 10% of the whole like targeted uh, uh, methylome. And this is uh, again, um, uh, partly be because it's like uh, preferentially enriched for um, a region such as a CPG Island or like a promoter, but also this is like owing to the sparsity of the single cell data. And so, you know, we have um, throughout this work, we have tried to impl implement some like analytical and also experimental uh, uh, approaches to try and sort of like mitigate uh, this. And, you know, like, um, the, the main one is to perform a double enzymatic a, a digestion, which now basically allows to greatly increase the, the coverage at like a, a, a regulatory elements such as Enhancer or CTCF, uh, still at, at the same um, depth of uh, sequencing compared to single uh, enzymatic digestion, and uh, also other various like um, uh, analytical approaches such as uh, maybe like averaging DNA methylation across the fine genomic region or window to like overcome this sort of like sparsity, inherent sparsity of the data. And uh, yeah, I think, you know, as, as, as new technology come out, come out and new data analysis uh, uh, method, for sure, we will have a more accurate, more uh, half throughput and, you know, less sparse data to, to, to look at. But um, what we have is, is already pretty, pretty accurate in terms of at least DNA uh, methylation. Great, thank you. Um, um, uh, my, uh, I have another question, which was about using these technologies for other tumor types. So this was in gliomas. Has, are there plans for other uh, tumor types in the future or any? Yes, so I mean, we, I mean, do, do you want to take this one, Joshua? I can say uh, You can go ahead. Yeah, I mean, ahead. Those, yeah. So, I mean, yeah, we, we applied it already before in the context of leukemia, and we applied it in the lab, uh, in, in Landau lab, yeah, in the context of uh, brain tumor. And then um, we also applied it in the context of like clonal uh, hematopoiesis sample that have like a, a, a specific uh, a mutation in um, a DM, DM, DMT3A sample. And, and then um, that, that was also like put as a preprint um, uh, yesterday, actually, if you want to, to read out from Dan Landau group. And then, um, yeah, I also, I, yeah, these are sort of the major application, but I, I don't know if Josh, which is still in Dan's group, might be aware if they're doing something. Well, I, I was just uh, going to mention that depending on how you're going to study the cancer type. So, I mean, this approach here was nice because it used native uh, barcodes from patient samples. And I think uh, depending on the tumor type and how much methylation you might observe limits, if you can build uh, lineage trees that way, it depends on the resolution and how much methylation you observe. But there are other approaches that where you can look at, uh, you know, construct lineages more artificially uh, 
in uh, or at, you know using uh, sort of like these CRISPR Cas9 uh, barcoding experiments uh, that people are starting to use. I've seen it now uh, in a model, but these are only in models on patient tumors of lung adenocarcinoma and uh, I believe pancreatic cancer. But I think this is unique as far as human patient samples. If I I could be wrong, I don't know if that if you can correct me. Yeah, I mean, this is goes like in parallel with like, you know, what what pe people have been trying to like recreate lineages using um, a, a genetic a, a mutation or like copy number or like micro or satellite. And so here we are just exploring another avenue to, to reconstruct cancer lineages. Okay, we have um, a question here in the chat. How transferable is the method studying heritability and cell state dynamics to other differentiation biological processes aside from cancer samples? That's the answer. That. Yeah, <laughs> uh, that's a great question. Uh, that's actually what I've been working on since uh, this paper is uh, uh, so, uh, taking these methods and generalizing them so that they'll be usable, not just for other uh, cancer samples, but also for uh, de uh, developmental processes um, unrelated to cancer. Uh, so that's in the works and hopefully uh, we'll be uh, getting that out soon, but uh, the, we're hoping that it'll be quite generalizable. Well, great. Um, if there are no more questions, uh, thank you. Um, thank you both so much. It's been a very exciting talk. Uh, as always, the seminar has been recorded and it will be available soon on YouTube and on our website. And feel free to visit our website or find us on Twitter for the latest announcements regarding upcoming talks or other events. With that, I'd like to thank everyone for joining and we hope to see you at our next seminar. Have a wonderful day. Thanks, Josh and Fede.